Disgusting pathetic loser is the weakest in his village, but the strongest in the world. The ridiculous Kunlun village is a place where they all think they're so special because they're descendants of some ancient heroes. These losers believe they can take on any army in the world. So, there's this kid named Lloyd, and he's the weakest of the weak in his little village. He dreams of becoming a soldier, but he's more like a mosquito compared to real warriors. But guess what? When he steps out into the real world, suddenly he's stronger than all those village idiots. But wait, it gets even more ridiculous. Lloyd can't even catch a rabbit, and he gets humiliated by it. Pathetic, I tell you. But then this guy named Shoma shows up, holding the rabbit like it's some great accomplishment. He's like an older brother to Lloyd, and they both love to travel. Anyway, Shoma gives Lloyd a stupid book from the outside world, as if that's going to help him become a soldier. Time passes, and Lloyd grows up, though he's probably still weak as hell. He finds himself in a city, looking for a place to stay. And what does he stumble upon? A witch's house. This Marie witch lady tells Lloyd to go find an inn or a guild because she doesn't want him hanging around her place. But then Lloyd talks about Kunlun and mentions their chief, Alka, she freaks out. Turns out Alka used to be her. To make matters worse, Lloyd pulls out a crystal and shows her. The village chief appears from the crystal. So, Alka decides to command Marie to take care of Lloyd during his stay. Of course, poor Marie has no choice but to accept, even though she's not thrilled about it. Alka loves to bully and scare her into submission, making her life a living nightmare. Now, Lloyd wants to take this ridiculous military academy exam. He's desperate to be accepted so he can chase his silly dream. While Marie reluctantly instructs Lloyd to settle into her humble abode, out of nowhere, Alka appears like a teleporting sorceress. She used the crystal as her fancy teleporter to invade Marie's personal space. Marie, being the voice of reason, tells Alka to knock it off with her superhuman magic tricks. But does Alka care? Nope. She goes on and on about how cute, good, and pure Lloyd is, as if Marie even cares about that. Then she has the audacity to remind Marie to take good care of the boy. But before leaving, Alka decides to punish Marie for her insolence. She places a curse of small misfortunes on poor Marie, all because she dared to call Alka an old lowly grandma. This curse involves ancient rune magic, which can be devastating if handled incorrectly. The next morning, Lloyd decides to play kitchen hero and makes breakfast for Marie. Surprise, surprise, he's actually a decent cook. Marie asks him why he wants to be a soldier, and what does he say? Oh, it's the same old sob story about not being as strong as everyone else in his village. He goes on and on about admiring some fictional soldier from childhood stories. Marie asks him about the combat test, which apparently is a crucial part of the military exam. And what does Lloyd reveal? He's got weak stamina. It took him a pathetic six days to reach the city, while his grandfather could have made the journey in just two days. Of course, Marie is left dumbfounded, thinking he took the easy way and hopped on a train or something. But no, this genius decided to run all the way to the city. Marie finally realizes that Lloyd, the clueless wonder, actually has superpowers. But he has to have his own peculiar way of seeing the world. According to him, monsters are nothing more than oversized wild animals, and the real monsters are the so-called demon kings. Marie tells Lloyd that he's underestimating himself. And here's where it gets even more ridiculous. Thanks to Lloyd clumsily wiping coffee off her face with a simple cloth, her skin becomes magically smooth. And to add insult to injury, she discovers that he can use ancient rune magic. She's frustrated, not because he has potential, but because the spell he used is one she spent three long years learning. But wait, there's more. Lloyd can also summon rain. And here Marie is trying to teach him some common sense because clearly he's lacking in that department. It's like trying to teach a rock how to dance. Pointless. The next day, Lloyd is prancing around the city when he saves some damsel in distress from a monster by stomping on it like it's a bug. Then, as if that wasn't enough, he casually flings the monster away as if it's nothing. After his little display of strength, he helps the girl, Selen, stand up and cleans her off with his precious magical cloth because she has the audacity to get mud on her. But does he stick around to bask in his heroic glory? Of course not. He's got errands to run, so he leaves like a true gentleman. However, this Selen girl just can't take a hint and introduces herself to him. He does the same and then scurries off. Turns out Selen is some noble who's been mocked and insulted because of this silly cursed belt she wears on her head. They even gave her the lovely nickname Cursed Belt Princess. Apparently, some priest told her that one day strength would remove her curse. As she reminisces about her past, she gets frustrated and tries to rip the belt off by force, not caring if she hurts herself. 
but guess what? It easily comes off. Turns out Lloyd managed to disenchant the cursed belt using his magical cloth. From that moment on, she sees him as her knight in shining armor. When Lloyd finally gets back from his stupid errand, he hands Marie a dumb brochure, and for some reason, she actually treasures it. The next day, we meet Murthofen and Colleen, the academy instructors. Then we have Riho, the one-armed mercenary with a laundry list of crimes, who only joined the academy because they bribed her with dropping the charges against her. And let's not forget about Alan, the snobby noble Aximon. He lectures Selen about ruining his precious reputation just because they both come from noble families. On the other hand, Riho is sitting next to Lloyd and apparently consents his supposedly impressive powers, which scares her. Lloyd tries to strike up a conversation with Riho, but thank goodness it doesn't last long because Selen swoops in and pushes Riho away. Then she starts fawning over Lloyd, claiming him as hers, and has the nerve to ask Riho who she is. Thankfully, Lloyd has some sense and says they just met, so Selen lets Riho go. Riho, being the opportunist she is, starts getting interested in them because she thinks they both smell like money. The stupid academy tests begin, and even Mirth often can sense Lloyd's power and starts cheering for him. And when the day comes for the test results, Marie and Alka, in their deluded state, actually believe it will be a piece of cake for Lloyd to pass. Well, he fails. During the admission class, Selen and Riho go wild trying to find Lloyd, unable to believe that he failed. Even Mirth often is clueless about how it happened. But during the orientation, we're subjected to Colleen blabbering on about how the kingdom they live in, Azami, is on the verge of war with the Jiu Empire. So now they have to deal with all their pathetic local issues before they can focus on the war. And guess what? One of those issues happens to be the disappearance of Princess Marie. Colleen announces that whoever manages to find the princess will receive a reward. Oh, and as an extra bonus, they'll get their pathetic little wishes granted. Riho and Selen, in their infinite wisdom, decide that this is the solution to Lloyd's so-called problem. On his way home, Lloyd, the disappointment that he is, comes across a stupid monster. And what does he do? He effortlessly punches it away. But he spots a flyer for a job opening at a restaurant. When Lloyd arrives at the restaurant, he's immediately attacked by the owner. Apparently, this idiot can sense Lloyd's powers as he pathetically tries to attack him. Of course, he doesn't believe that Lloyd is there for the job offer. Even after Lloyd demonstrates his cooking and cleaning skills, the owner remains suspicious, thinking that Lloyd must be lying about something. On the other hand, we have these three geniuses who review Lloyd's test results and discover that he failed the written exam. But when Colleen shows up and sees the paper, she realizes that what was written on it are ancient runes. She goes on and on about how powerful they are and suggests that Lloyd might have powers above their academy's level. But of course, she can't do anything about it because he wasn't accepted. And then, out of nowhere, the girls come up with a brilliant plan. They tell Colleen not to worry because they'll find the princess, and as a reward, they'll demand Lloyd's admission to the academy. Meanwhile, Lloyd, in his never-ending streak of luck, ends up getting hired by Chrome, the restaurant owner. Why? Well, Lloyd is actually good at cooking. And Chrome, the former leader of the Royal Guard, wants to keep an eye on him to make sure nothing bad happens. When Lloyd returns home, the girls can't believe that he failed. Lloyd asks Alka if he can take the exam next year, as if failing once wasn't enough humiliation. And to add insult to injury, he asks Marie if he can keep living with her for a little longer. And to convince her, he promises to pay rent with his salary. Marie has no problem with Lloyd staying longer, and Alka, probably out of pity, also gives him permission to continue. As Lloyd busies himself with preparing dinner, Marie suddenly switches to serious mode and asks Alka if she can use her power to save the kingdom. Apparently, for the past five years, someone has been manipulating the weak-willed king to advocate for war, and it's only a matter of time before they declare war against Jew. Alka reminds Marie about their rules. You see, the people of Kunlun only intervene when the threats surpass human understanding. You know, things like demon kings or other ridiculously high-level threats. Disputes like wars and other trivial human conflicts. Well, those aren't their concern. Alka advises Marie not to rush into this situation without thinking it through. But she also warns Marie that if she dares involve Lloyd in her attempt to stop this conflict, she will whisk him away back to their village. With that charming warning, Alka struts off, not without leaving Marie with a curse of medium-scale misfortunes whenever she dares to call her old. Marie can't handle the pain from her cramps and decides to throw Alka's precious crystal into a well. The next day, Murthofen and Riho are having a riveting discussion about Lloyd's pathetic situation when they stumble upon him at the restaurant. Oh, how shocking it is to see Lloyd toiling away there, with Chrome barking orders at him like he's some kind of servant. 
After completing the task of taking out the trash, Lloyd spots Marie strolling into an alley, and because he has nothing better to do, he decides to follow her. He arrives at a square just in time to witness Selen and Alan engaged in a heated battle. Selen discovers that her precious belt protects her from attacks, and of course, she believes that these belts are some sort of blessing from Lloyd. In her typical delusional state, Selen spots Lloyd and immediately assumes that he has come to her rescue. Coincidentally, all the fools who have been desperately searching for Lloyd somehow end up gathering in the square. Selen proudly declares that Lloyd has come to fight for her. Upon hearing this, the others force poor Alan into a fight with him. Never mind the fact that cadets are not supposed to attack civilians. Alan, being the clueless idiot that he is, thinks they're doing it to test his own capabilities, so he willingly agrees. He even has the audacity to ask Lloyd to land the first punch. The rest of the fools, fearing for Alan's pathetic life, try to stop them. Luckily for Alan, Marie swoops in with her wind magic just in time to whisk Lloyd away before he can harm him. The only one who witnesses this miraculous rescue is Chrome, the ever-watchful restaurant owner. Once they're far enough from the square, Marie starts reprimanding Lloyd for almost using his strength on others. But he interrupts her and thanks her for saving him from Alan. Marie is shocked by Lloyd's blatant ignorance but can't help but be touched by his innocence. He foolishly promises to do anything for her, claiming that he owes her his pathetic life. Out of nowhere, Chrome magically appears and demands that Lloyd return to the restaurant. After Lloyd obediently leaves, we finally learn the shocking revelation that Marie is the lost princess. And as if that wasn't enough, Chrome reveals that he left the royal guard as a supposed sign of responsibility for allowing the princess to disappear under his watch. Marie shares her knowledge of the kingdom's current situation with Chrome. She spills the beans about the corrupt king and the impending declaration of war. She shamelessly asks for his help in preventing this disaster. Back at the academy, Colleen, probably fueled by her excessive caffeine intake, brings coffee to Murthofen. She notices that he's once again buried in his precious papers. So, this girl asks Murthofen why he works so damn hard. And what does he do? He spills his pathetic tale. He was born in some famine-stricken city. And one day, Jew's army swoops in and snatches away whatever little they had. Now, Murthofen doesn't want anyone else to go through the same crap he did. So, he's on a quest for peace, or maybe even some twisted revenge. Meanwhile, Riho and Selen are still on their little mission to find the princess, and they asked Marie for information. They discover that Lloyd actually lives with Marie. So, when Marie returns home and finds these unwanted guests, she's clearly taken aback. Selen is giving her death glares, and Riho is desperately trying to remember where she's seen Marie's face. Once the initial chaos settles, Riho finally gets to the point and asks Marie for information about the whereabouts of some person. Obviously, Marie doesn't want these meddling girls to find out that she's the princess, so she tries to brush them off by claiming she doesn't deal with finding lost princesses. But Riho just has to be clever and respond that she never mentioned a princess. She already suspected Marie's true identity. And to make matters worse, Selen comes up with her own little theory that Marie is Lloyd's wife. Marie misunderstands, and in her confusion, she ends up revealing her own damn identity. She then attempts to deny being the princess. Too bad Rio heard her confess it earlier. So now, the girls spill their reasons for finding the princess, claiming it's all to help Lloyd get into the academy. Marie likes the idea and suggests exchanging information. They'll share details about the king, the academy, and the military. Riho responds that before they spill their guts, Marie better reveal her precious identity first. Marie tells the girls that they probably already have an inkling of who she is. But before she can go any further, Lloyd interrupts and declares that he already knows the truth about Marie's identity. According to him, she's the savior of the kingdom. Lloyd sees Marie as some kind of hero working in secret to save the kingdom. And, of course, he just has to offer his help. But Marie shuts him down real quick. She tells him that he's nothing but weak and can't possibly be of any use to her. Poor Lloyd slinks out of the room in a pitiful state of despair. Now that Lloyd's out of the picture, Marie finally reveals her true identity to the girls and pleads for their help in saving the kingdom. And what do Riho and Selen do? They scold Marie for mistreating Lloyd. Marie explains where Lloyd comes from and some warning from Alka about taking him back if he gets involved in human conflicts. Marie drops a bombshell. She reveals that the order to bring the princess to the castle, dead or alive, could be from some manipulator. This complicates her plans because she can't act all diplomatic and stuff, since whoever issued that order probably wants the war to start soon. The girls upon hearing this riveting information, decide that they'll help Marie achieve her precious plans. Marie just needs to focus on freeing her father with some disenchant rune. While she's pondering about it, Alka decides to grace her with her company. 
She thanks Marie for supposedly keeping Lloyd out of her affairs, even though it broke his oh-so-fragile heart. But the real important question is why Marie threw a crystal in a well. Alka decides to punish Marie by cursing her to end one out of every ten sentences with meow. And to add to the circus, there's some festival happening that night, and Alka decides to take care of Lloyd. She can see that he's sad, but she uses this as an opportunity to score some points with him. She takes Lloyd around the festival, indulging in all the mindless games with him. But a bunch of pesky insect monsters decide to crash the party. Lloyd easily defeats these so-called monsters. To him, they're nothing more than annoying pests. He rushes off to find Marie, completely disregarding Alka's protests. Let's switch to Chrome, who's meeting with the king. Apparently, he's requesting reinstatement into the military service. Murthoffen tells him to wait a few days for the king's response. Chrome decides to spill the beans to Murthoffen. He reveals that he's found the princess, thanks to the investigations carried out by Riho and Selen. They're all on a mission to uncover the mastermind behind manipulating the king and ordering the search for the princess. And guess who Chrome suspects? You got it, Murthoffen. Apparently, he fits the description. Murthoffen doesn't even deny it. He proudly claims that he made the king his puppet. Marie arrives with the girls. Surprisingly, the king, who hasn't uttered a word since this whole mess started, finally decides to open his mouth. Oh, and by the way, he looks like a frog. Mirth often gets attacked by the king himself. The king then reveals to the group that he's the real mastermind behind everything. He manipulated Mirth often to free him and take possession of the poor king's body. The king decides to transform Murthoffen into some sort of fighter grasshopper. Seeing the dire situation, the group decides to split into two. Chrome and the girls take it upon themselves to entertain Murthoffen, while Marie goes off to free the king. Marie confronts the entity that has taken over her father's body, but surprise, surprise, it's all useless. This entity effortlessly deflects all her feeble attempts at magic, not even breaking a sweat. Marie decides to try a surprise attack. But of course, she gets distracted when she catches a glimpse of her father's face. And what do you think happens next? Yep, you guessed it. The entity counters her attack with ease. The entity decides to break Marie's hand. Now she's all helpless and can't even cast her precious little rune spell. As Marie resigns herself to her doom, the king, or should I say, the big bad demon Lord Abaddon, reveals himself. But instead of being scared like any rational person would be, Marie gets angry. She's upset that the king didn't bother to mention he was a demon lord earlier. Talk about misplaced priorities. So what does Marie do next? She runs away like a little coward to find Lloyd. Speaking of Lloyd, he encounters Alan, the scaredy cat who can't handle a few bugs. Lloyd decides to give Alan a little pep talk. And of course, he effortlessly obliterates a monster while he's at it. Alan is amazed by Lloyd's strength. But Lloyd brushes it off like it's no big deal. Just a bug, he says. Lloyd manages to convince Alan that he's some kind of hero and wishes him luck. Alan, fueled by this newfound motivation, miraculously saves a civilian from a monster. Meanwhile, Alka realizes that the insects are connected to a baton. So, she decides to join the party and casts a magic circle that rains down boulders on the monsters. Back in the castle, the grasshopper mirth often effortlessly beats Chrome and Riho. They're no match for his strength and speed. But Selen decides to summon Lloyd by confronting Murthoffen. But lucky for her, her little belt thingy manages to block all of Murthoffen's attacks. And just in the nick of time, Riho goes off to find Lloyd. She doesn't have to go far, because Lloyd magically appears. He sees poor Murthoffen and what does Lloyd do? He swats him down effortlessly, just like squashing a bug. Lloyd starts giving Murthoffen a little lecture on what it means to be a good soldier. And it works. Turns out, Murthoffen's human mind starts to come back. Lloyd assumes that Murthoffen is just some drunken fool causing trouble at the festival. So he scolds him, calling him a bad soldier. It only makes him angry, and he transforms back into his monstrous form. Murthoffen, in his blind rage, goes for another attack. But Lloyd dodges the pathetic attempt and delivers a headbutt right to Murthoffen's skull, cracking it like an egg. Marie shows up out of nowhere. She sees Lloyd and thanks him for being there. The Demon Lord makes his grand entrance, and Lloyd confuses the Demon Lord for a drunken fool wearing a festival costume. Classic Lloyd. But Marie decides to use this to her advantage. She lies to the Demon Lord, claiming she already defeated the monster manipulating the king. And she tells him that the king in front of him is just some drunkard who's causing a disturbance. Marie asks Lloyd a simple favor. She asks him to use his magic cloth to clean up the king. So when he cleans the king with that magic cloth, the demon is expelled from the king's body. Lloyd decides to use the cloth to heal Marie's hand, and Marie repaid him with a hug. From there, things miraculously start to improve for the kingdom. The war miraculously doesn't happen, 
and Lloyd runs into Shoma, someone he's apparently excited to see after a long time. Shoma congratulates Lloyd for defeating Abaddon, which only makes Lloyd suspicious, because, you know, he never said anything about it. Alka decides to show up. Lloyd tries to tell Marie that he was talking with Shoma, but Shoma disappears. Meanwhile, Chrome and Colleen are having a little chat. We find out that Murthofen, as punishment for his previous actions, has been sent to Cumlin to perform forced labor. Alka shows Murthofen a vast field of wheat that he will be plowing. She explains that during times of famine and war, she usually distributes the wheat to villages in need. Murthofen has a sudden realization. He remembers when his own village was saved by someone who came to distribute wheat. This realization motivates him to actually work. Now, on to the important stuff. Marie has made up her mind. She won't be returning to her pampered life as a princess. She's perfectly content with the way she lives now. And of course, Lloyd has managed to secure a spot as a recruit in the academy. But who do we have to thank for that? Alan apparently was rewarded for killing so many monsters during the past conflict. And as a result, he requested for Lloyd to enter the military academy. Lloyd introduces Alka to Riho and Selen. Alka notices that Selen's belt is actually an artifact from Kunlun village. But for now, Lloyd joins his friends to return to the academy. One night, Lloyd accompanies Marie and Chrome on an errand. Or so Lloyd thinks. Little does he know, Marie wants his help to obtain the holy sword that supposedly can't be pulled from its spot. With that sword, one can supposedly rule the world. But of course, you need immense magical power to draw it. Lloyd effortlessly removes the sword, just as Marie predicted. And of course, life at the academy is a breeze for Lloyd, especially the physical training, because he just effortlessly runs those laps without breaking a sweat. Just when Riho thought she could catch a break during magic theory class, Colleen, the ever-enthusiastic teacher, barges into the classroom. She announces that they'll be skipping magical theory and jumping straight into practice. Colleen has a grand idea. She wants to select candidates for a match against Rukaju Academy. Apparently, Colleen is quite invested in this event because she desperately wants the school to break its losing streak. So off they go to the practice field, where Colleen proceeds to give the students an extensive explanation of the three types of magic that exist. Chanting, sigils, and conduits. Chanting involves speaking magical incantations. Sigils involve using runes, and conduits involve using objects to channel magic. But of course, during the practice session, Lloyd's magic spells turn out to be a bit too powerful. Colleen informs him that he won't be able to compete in the event. Why? She doesn't want him accidentally harming someone. While the students take a break from their intense training, Selen approaches Colleen and asks her to teach her healing magic. Riho, interrupting their conversation, explains to Selen the risks involved if healing magic is not performed correctly. But Alan suggests that if healing magic is so complex, it's best to start learning it now. Even Lloyd expresses interest in learning this challenging magic. Colleen agrees to help them. But of course, they'll need a wounded person for practice. Who better to volunteer than Alan himself? Now, let's switch to Marie. She just wants to relax in the comfort of her own home. But two unexpected guests, Mina and Philo, make their way into her house uninvited. Marie demands to know their purpose for intruding. Mina and Philo explain that they are looking for someone in a picture. But before she can inquire further, her sister Philo goes into alert mode because Lloyd arrives at that moment. Philo attacks him, but much to her surprise, her attack does absolutely no damage to him. Lloyd manages to completely misunderstand the situation and thinks Mina just wanted to murder a harmless little fly. Then he sees a picture in Mina's hands and points, stating that it's Riho. This imbecile decides it's a fantastic idea to blabber to the girls about how they can find Riho at the academy. But the stupidity doesn't end there. Philo comes barging in, and decides she wants Lloyd as her teacher. She even offers to do whatever he asks. Meanwhile, Marie asks if she can stay in the house and then proceeds to undress Lloyd. Of course, things escalate quickly because apparently, Marie has no control over her own house. She kicks the girls out. Lloyd manages to get injured by Philo. When Marie kindly suggests getting his injury treated, he dismisses it, claiming it's just a broken rib that magically heals in a mere three hours. Then he go make dinner, leaving Marie to deal with the aftermath of his idiocy. Alka appears out of nowhere, as usual, and decides to transform Marie into a butterfly because apparently, that's a great way to spend quality time with Lloyd. Later that night, Marie transforms back, but she's completely naked. And who happens to witness this? Lloyd, of course. Lloyd flees the scene because apparently, he's incapable of handling anything remotely awkward. The next day at school, Riho decides to ask Colleen why she's so desperate to win. 
Colleen reveals that someone she despises has become the headmistress of Rokuju Academy. Rawl suddenly appears with Mina and Philo. She's only there to propose that Riho returns with her, threatening to take away everything dear to Riho if she refuses. She leaves, eagerly awaiting Riho's answer on the day of the match. Riho carries the gloom around for the entire day, and Lloyd notices it. During dinner that evening, Lloyd decides to ask Marie for advice on how to cheer someone up. Now, keep in mind, these two had an incredibly awkward incident the day before, so naturally, Marie assumes he's referring to her. She suggests asking the person out on a date. But alas, her shock and confusion are palpable when she realizes he is actually talking about Riho. Moving on to the next day, Lloyd, in his usual oblivious manner, musters up the courage to ask Riho out on a date. She's shocked by the audacity but somehow manages to accept. Lloyd expresses his noble intentions of wanting to know what's troubling her. Riho shares her tale of growing up in an orphanage where she met Rawl. Apparently, Rawl taught Riho how to use magic because she just happened to have a talent for it. But Riho's left arm is a useless piece of garbage that limits her magical abilities. But Rawl swooped in one day with a mithril prosthetic arm that magically enhances Riho's powers. However, Riho decides to run away from Rawl when she discovers that the prosthetic arm was designed to boost her magical power, and Rawl plans to use her to obtain the Holy Sword. Riho adds that anyone who touches the prosthetic arm with their bare hands gets their magic powers sucked away. The arm is currently sucking away Riho's powers too, but she just can't bring herself to get rid of it because, you know, logic. Riho, who once admired Rawl as an older sister figure, now sees her as the person who falsely accused her of crimes she didn't commit. Just as Lloyd is trying to play the knight in shining armor, Selim, because we clearly need more characters in this mess, appears out of nowhere to accuse Lloyd of being a traitor. More drama and revenge, just what we needed. Selini decides it's the perfect time to reprimand Riho for not sharing the secret of her magical arm. Together, they vow to seek revenge during the upcoming magic match. But before we get to the main event, the schools come up with the brilliant idea of holding a demonstration to showcase what the magic match is all about. And who better to represent their academy than Selini and Riho. However, Philo decides she wants to fight Lloyd instead. To settle this unnecessary conflict, a student named Mikona, who seems to have some personal grudge against Lloyd, steps up and offers to fight in his place, claiming she can show everyone how it's done and prove she's better than him. So, the practice match begins with Mikona and Philo, but Philo, with her magical stone or whatever nonsense she uses, easily defeats Mikona. After her humiliating loss, Mikona continues to treat Lloyd like dirt. When Lloyd tries to show some concern and check if she's okay, she throws his uselessness right back at him, claiming he can't do anything by himself. Mikona actually goes to Marie's house to get her wounds treated, and it turns out Mikona has deeper feelings for Marie. Oh, the love triangle we never asked for. The fact that Lloyd now lives with Marie doesn't exactly endear him to Mikona. Now, on the day of the match, we have Rawl asking Riho if she'll return with her. Obviously, Riho calls Rawl out on her despicable actions and declares that she will protect the orphanage from all of Rawl's schemes. The moment is interrupted once again by Chrome who announces that the prize for the winning school will be none other than the Holy Sword. Rawl, upon learning that the sword is authentic, decides to participate in the tournament as a student. Seeing the situation unfold, Colleen decides to include Lloyd in the tournament as well. Ah, the tournament is about to kick off, but Riho decides to squeeze in some last-minute learning and asks Colleen to teach her healing magic. Meanwhile, Marie had plans to attend the match, but Alka won't allow it. She curses Marie with stomach aches that strike every 10 minutes, and the only way to lift the curse is for Marie to grovel and apologize incessantly in front of the crystal until Alka decides to forgive her. Now, let's dive into the competition itself. The rules are simple, one-on-one -on -one battles, and the first school to win twice will be declared the victor. In these battles, participants can use all three types of magic, but physical attacks are strictly forbidden as they lead to immediate disqualification. The first battle commences, with Philo and Selen taking the stage. Selen faces a tough time initially because her trusty belt fails to protect her from Philo's relentless magic attacks. But after some scolding, the belt finally responds to her and starts blocking Philo's onslaught. However, Philo cunningly wins the battle by manipulating Selen into using her belt as a trap which is considered a physical attack and leads to her immediate disqualification. Moving on to the next match, we have Mina and Lloyd facing off. Mina, eager to test Lloyd's strength, especially since Philo holds him in such high regard, comes out swinging. She attempts to suffocate Lloyd by trapping his face in a water bubble, hoping for a quick victory. 
However, much to her dismay, after a grueling 20 minutes, Lloyd is still breathing inside that bubble. Frustrated, Mina switches tactics and tries her luck with Aqua Wall. But Lloyd, with his wind magic, counters her attack, canceling out her magic and sending her flying out of the podium. Lloyd is declared the winner of the second match. Now, the highly anticipated match we've all been waiting for, Riho vs. Rawl. They begin exchanging flame magic attacks. Rawl decides that the best way to defeat Riho is by wearing down her precious little magical arm. Rawl gets up close with Riho and manages to remove Riho's mithril arm. But Riho, being the crafty little witch she is, takes advantage of Rawl's idiocy and punches her right in the face with her intact arm. There's a magical stone sealed into Riho's arm, along with a delayed healing enchantment. So when Riho's punch lands, it causes a freaking explosion. Talk about overkill. Of course Riho's arm magically heals after the explosion. Now, just to add insult to injury, Riho decides to play mind games with Rawl. She pretends to start some high-level chant attack. Rawl faints before Riho even finishes the damn spell chant, and Riho is crowned the winner. But does Rawl learn her lesson? Oh no, she's got a one-track mind. Defeat or no defeat, she's determined to get her grubby little hands on that holy sword. So when she finally wakes up from her pitiful fainting, one of her lackeys informs her that Lloyd has the sword now. Turns out, there's a witch involved in this mess too. And this witch happens to be an overprotective older sister. So Rawl orders her lackey, Philo, to go and kidnap the witch as leverage to get the sword back. But Philo didn't pay attention during the conversation. So when she arrives to carry out her task, she sees Marie, the supposed overprotective sister, bowing to a freaking crystal. And what does Philo conclude from this brilliant observation? That Marie is overly protective of the crystal. Meanwhile, Lloyd returns home only to find a note from Philo. And what does Lloyd assume? That Marie has been kidnapped. He sees her brochure on the ground. Panic ensues, and off he goes to the location mentioned in the note. Rawl realizes her blunder in sending Philo to fetch Marie, only to have her return with a dumb crystal instead. Rawl's lackeys inform her that Lloyd is on his way to meet them. Philo immediately sees Lloyd as a worthy opponent. Apparently, hand-to-hand -hand combat is her so-called specialty, and she wants to prove her superiority by defeating Lloyd. But Lloyd decides to propose a deal to Philo. If he wins their little match, Philo must spill the beans on Marie's whereabouts. Philo accepts this ridiculous proposition. And what brilliant idea does Lloyd come up with to settle their little dispute? An arm wrestling match. Apparently, Lloyd has some traumatic childhood memory of a girl breaking his bones during a wrist-slapping game. Despite his fears of being hurt by Philo, Lloyd believes that arm wrestling is the safest way for him to win. Philo, on the other hand, agrees because Lloyd fed her some nonsense about settling things that way in Kunlun, and she blindly believes his words thanks to some village legends. Meanwhile, one of Rawl's minions decides to attack poor Alan, who's just minding his own business, holding onto the holy sword like a clueless fool. But Mina swoops in to save Alan's. Apparently, she's not too pleased with how Rawl treated her precious sister. Back to the main event, Lloyd and Philo continue their arm wrestling match, which somehow escalates into an aerial contest. The crate they were using as a table breaks, but Lloyd decides to use a wind spell to change their momentum. And of course, this brilliant move allows him to defeat Philo. Philo accepts her defeat with whatever dignity she has left. Out of nowhere, she suddenly proposes marriage to him. Lloyd is taken aback by this unexpected proposal, but he quickly remembers why he's there and asks about Marie's whereabouts. Philo responds that Marie was in the bathroom when she entered her house. Rawl realizes that her meticulously crafted plans are falling apart like a house of cards. Alka burst out of the crystal in a fit of anger because apparently, Rawl wasn't the precious Lloyd she was expecting. Alka decides to explode the entire area, conveniently sending Rawl flying into a nearby river. Thankfully, Alan rushes to save Rawl, even though Mina advises against it. As Rawl rests in the hospital, she takes a moment to reflect on where exactly things went wrong. And what does she remember? Ah, her younger days with Riho. They had this plan to rebuild the orphanage. While all this is happening, there's another adversary lurking in the shadows. Some random man is busy manipulating Rawl's memory, and he reveals that he's been controlling her. As he saunters out of the hospital, he contemplates how to obtain the Holy Sword and unlock the last dungeon. As the Academy's long break approaches, the girls make plans to spend time with our Lloyd. Riho intends to invite him out. Unfortunately for her, Lloyd already has plans for the break. Selen has been summoned home by her father. And what does she contemplate in this dire situation? Extreme measures, of course. Like setting her own house on fire just to avoid staying home for the vacation. Oh, and let's not forget about Alan. 
He's got plans for the break too. But do the girls care about his arranged marriage interview? Of course not. Back to Marie's house, Alka and Marie are desperately vying for Lloyd's attention. But their hopes are quickly crushed when Lloyd reveals that he's already made plans for the vacation. Apparently, Chrome has arranged a job for Lloyd at a hotel, where he'll be staying for the entire vacation. Alka and Marie, in their desperate attempts to cling to Lloyd, consider going with him. But Lloyd asks them not to tag along. He wants to be self-reliant, apparently. So, Lloyd arrives at the hotel, unintentionally startling his new boss, who introduces himself as Koba. Turns out Koba is also a former member of the Royal Army. During the tour of the hotel, Koba mentions a peculiar problem they've been facing. It seems that some guests have been falling into a comatose state recently, and no one knows the cause. During Lloyd's orientation, he meets Kikayo, a senior worker who seems to lack any sense of diligence. Well, she takes advantage of the newcomer and assigns him the task of cleaning the pool. And not just any pool, mind you, but a large area. But Lloyd effortlessly completes the task in an instant. Impressed by his abilities, Koba decides to entrust Lloyd with another task. This time, it's dealing with a troublesome noble named Threonine. Apparently, this noble is notoriously difficult to please. To Koba's surprise, Lloyd and Threonine actually hit it off quite well. It turns out Lloyd's knowledge of forestry impresses the noble. It seems that Kikayo actually works for Threonine, and they've been investigating the coma cases at the hotel. Threonine suspects that illegal treat cultivation is taking place in the forest near the hotel. He believes the hotel owner is the culprit. Now, they need to act quickly to confirm their theories before the forest is declared a national treasure, which would hinder their investigation. Threonine has agreed to hold a meeting to arrange a marriage ceremony between his son and a local lord's daughter, but his true motive is to gather information about the nobles' involvement in treat trading. They are tree-like monsters that, when defeated, leave behind high-quality lumber that can be sold for a fortune. Recently, a treant sapling was stolen from a research laboratory. And here's where it gets interesting. Rumors suggest that it was brought to this very region by a merchant. After the treant sapling's arrival, people started falling into comas. Treant saplings have a parasitic nature, which enhances the physical abilities of their host. Now, Kikayo quickly considers Lloyd as a potential host for the treant all because of the extraordinary skills he displayed earlier in the day. She shares her suspicions about Lloyd with Threonai, who also believes that Lloyd might be connected to all these unusual occurrences. To complicate matters, Threonine provides Kikayo with a medicine that can remove the treat from Lloyd's body when applied. That evening, Kikayo attempts to give Lloyd a tea containing the medicine. But alas, Koba enters the room and suggests that Lloyd rest for the next day's work. In a twist of fate, Koba ends up drinking the tea himself and spits it out due to its awful taste. Realizing her mistake, Kikayo panics and jumps out of the window, leaving both her and Koba with a misunderstanding. Each of them believes the other to be responsible for the coma cases. The next day Riho checks into the hotel for her vacation. To her surprise, she discovers that Lloyd works there when she calls for room service to request a massage. When Lloyd arrives to provide the massage, Riho's shyness prevents her from allowing him to proceed. Meanwhile, Selin and her father also arrive at the hotel. Selin finds out that her dear old daddy wants to arrange her marriage. She's all worked up about the possibility of being stuck with this guy named Alan. But Selin thinks she's already engaged to some other dude named Lloyd. She can't even refuse her father's ridiculous plan, so she comes up with a brilliant plan B. To harm Alan when he walks through the door. When the door opens, it's not Alan standing there, it's Lloyd. And Selin is just over the moon with joy. She drags Lloyd away to have a little chat, thinking her prayers have been answered. Turns out, Alan conveniently falls into a coma, so Lloyd is asked to take Alan's place. Riho has to explain the whole situation to Selin because she can't figure it out on her own, and Lloyd decides to investigate the comas. Selin sees this as a chance to get closer to Lloyd. She knows Riho is trying to cover for him, so she suggests that they go on a date. They'll pretend to be a couple while they do their little investigation outside the hotel. And just when things couldn't get any more ridiculous, Shoma shows up out of nowhere riding a delivery carriage full of firebombs. And Lloyd introduces Shoma to the girls. But of course, Shoma has more important things to do and leaves them hanging. While Selen and Lloyd continue their date, Riho can't shake off her unease about Shoma. Selen entrusts Riho with handling the delivery. 
And of course, they proceed with their little outing, doing all sorts of activities according to Selen's whims. They end up in a freaking canoe. She takes this perfect opportunity to pour her heart out to Lloyd, recounting her pathetic attempts to remove a belt on her own. Her dear old daddy made all sorts of efforts to help her. Selen actually admits that her repeated failures made her slightly happier. Apparently, those failures led her to meet Lloyd. She goes on and on about how as long as she's with him, everything will magically be okay. But Lloyd disagrees. He insists that he wouldn't have made it this far without the help of others. Cell encounters by emphasizing how Lloyd willingly helps people left and right, and that's why everyone supports him. Lloyd, feeling embarrassed, asks her to keep their little conversation between them. After their talk, they finally return to the shore. But Selen conveniently leaves Lloyd alone for a bit, and Kikaio seizes the opportunity to offer Lloyd a massage, and she wants to use the medicine on him. To her surprise, nothing happens. She starts wondering where the treat might be hiding in Lloyd's body. As a last resort, she even suspects it could be in his intimate parts. But before she can proceed with her crazy plan, Selen returns with her menacing expression. A little skirmish ensues between Kikaio and Selen. But lucky for Kikaio, Lloyd intervenes and she manages to escape. But Selen takes advantage of Lloyd's innocence. She suggests that after a massage, they should go visit the hot springs. And wouldn't you know it, it's a mixed bathing area. All the girls gather there, making it quite the show. Mina, the little Miss Perfect, reveals that she now works for the kingdom, and Philo is studying with them. Apparently, they're investigating the coma incidents. Alka starts blabbering about how a human infested with the treat might be the cause of all these comas. But out of nowhere, Philo decides to throw Alka at Kikaio, who's been lurking in the shadows like a creepy stalker. Kikaio quickly composes herself and gets back up, but she's approached by Threonine's secretary who's now infected by the treat. Turns out, this guy orchestrated all the chaos just to get revenge on Threonine for treating him like garbage all these years. Kikaio finally realizes that her accusations against Lloyd were completely unfounded. But before she can react, the treat-infested secretary wraps his slimy tentacles around her leg and starts draining her energy. Classic villain move. But fear not, because Lloyd comes to the rescue. He had been searching for Alka, and of course, he mistakes the secretary for someone in cosplay. Seriously, Lloyd, get it together. The secretary reveals his true form and summons more treats. He even goes by the name Erlking, the demon lord of the trees. Despite the gravity of the situation, Lloyd remains his usual unfazed self. He's all ready to help deal with the treats, much to Kikaio's disbelief. Meanwhile, Freonine, Koba, and Selen's dad are in the middle of a heated argument. They're accusing each other of being responsible for the cultivation of these treats. And just when things couldn't get any more dramatic, the secretary, who we now know is called Minoki, makes his grand entrance. He confesses to becoming the host of the stolen treat, just to tarnish Threonine's reputation and honor. He also takes credit for putting all those poor hotel guests into comas. But before Minoki can make his move, the girls swoop in to protect the men from the treats. Mina tries to attack Minoki with her flame magic, but of course, he nullifies it like it's nothing. Realizing that physical attacks might be their only option, the group decides to engage in combat. But Minoki turns out to be a real tough nut to crack. Riho comes up with a brilliant plan. She asks Selini to hold Minoki off for a while, but Selini's old dad jumps in to protect her when Minoki causes a disturbance, causing debris to come crashing down. Riho seizes the firebombs, and who's there to assist her? Alan, who conveniently wakes up just in time for all the commotion. Together, they start hurling those firebombs at Minoki. Philo decides to utilize his water magic and traps Minoki in a watery prison. Riho freezes the water, completely encasing Minoki. But Minoki turns out, he's got some kind of core or something. Meanwhile, Lloyd has successfully dealt with all the treats that the secretary summoned. Kikaio then informs him that Minoki is making his way back to the hotel. So Lloyd rushes back just in the nick of time. He then finds Selen and her dad in danger, about to be crushed by falling debris caused by Minoki's rampage. Luckily, Lloyd swoops in to save them. Once reunited with the rest of the gang, Marie takes it upon herself to explain the situation to Lloyd. She emphasizes that if they manage to strike the Treant's core, they can win this battle. It only took Lloyd this long to finally comprehend that the Treant is not some silly costume, but a real monster. Give the guy a cookie. Lloyd musters up all his strength and delivers a powerful punch. He shatters the ice encasing the Treant's core, marking his first victory against a monster. Oh, if only he weren't so innocent, he would realize that he's been defeating monsters left and right, even a couple of demon kings. Meanwhile, Alka wakes up underground, only to find herself immobilized by Shoma. 
He claims to have buried her there to prevent her from catching a cold. Clearly, he's got a great sense of humor, considering he knows she's immortal. Alka wonders how Shoma knows about her immortality and if he's working with the mysterious man. Shoma confirms her suspicions, leaving her even more curious about what lies ahead. The next morning, Alka takes it upon herself to repair the damage done to the hotel and heal the wounded guests. She even alters the memories of some individuals. Meanwhile, Frionine and Koba finally come to their senses and apologize to each other for their earlier accusations. Selen's father apologizes too, for pressuring her into an arranged marriage. He promises to support her growth as a soldier and entrusts her to Lloyd's care. Selen interprets this as her father giving his consent for her to marry Lloyd. However, Alka then mentions she wants a massage. She's in luck because Lloyd offers to give her one. Well, hold on to your hats because she doesn't anticipate being suplexed by him. But let's not forget about the mysterious man Shoma works with. Turns out, he's the same person who manipulated Riho's mind. And during a meeting, Makona is introduced to this man. When asked what he looks like to her, Makona describes him as looking like a priest. Shoma then informs his boss that Makona had her love stolen, and she confirms this, expressing her desire to defeat the person responsible and reclaim her love. In response, they provide her with medicine derived from the defeated demon kings. And without hesitation, Makona consumes the medicine. But let me tell you, she experiences excruciating pain as she grows a pair of wings. But with her newfound power, Mikona vows to destroy her enemy. Let's dive into the details of this exciting morning with Lloyd and his classmates. They arrive at Marie's house to pick him up after receiving a direct mission from the king, to hunt down a huge snake lurking in a nearby dungeon. The government wants to showcase their ability to ensure security, and respond to emergencies. Even Marie agrees that it would be more appropriate for the cadets to handle such a mission. So, off they go, back to the palace to meet the king. As they enter his presence, the king tries to lighten the mood by presenting himself awkwardly. After their encounter with the king, Colleen briefs them on the snake's location. Interestingly, the old man they encountered before is also searching for the snake and has learned about the mission. This old man, known as Sue, approaches Shoma and insists they need to act quickly because he wants to be the one to finish off the snake. However, it turns out that Alka is also hunting Sue. She meets up with Marie and persuades her to accompany her to the nearest dungeon, believing that Sue will be there. Curiosity piqued, they begin inspecting the dungeon together. While exploring, Philo and Selen pull Riho aside and ask her about her feelings for Lloyd. They want to know if Riho is in love with him or not. As they engage in this discussion, they suddenly hear a loud noise. Lloyd rushes towards the source of the noise. However, it turns out that the noise was caused by Marie and Alka crash landing into the dungeon. Alka tells Marie that she's free to leave, as she intends to continue her hunt for Sue. Marie decides to explore the dungeon in search of another way out. As she explores further, she comes face to face with a treant, with Makona trapped inside. Mikona wakes up, thrilled to see Marie. But of course, Marie just has to ruin the moment by asking what's happening. Mikona reluctantly admits that she's waiting for someone. She's actually waiting to carry out her revenge against the person who had the audacity to steal her love away. And guess what? Marie starts pondering the bizarre idea of Lloyd being the thief who snatched Mikona's man. Naturally, Marie's curiosity gets the best of her, and she has the nerve to ask Makona who this mystery person is. But oh no, Makona is suddenly too shy to spill the beans. The girl can't even express herself properly. Makona decides to trap Marie with a freaking tentacle. Meanwhile, Marie falls into desperation and wishes for Lloyd to come to her rescue. Luckily for Marie, Lloyd actually shows up. He asks Makona to release Marie, and what does she do? Not only does she refuse to listen, but she also threatens to unleash even worse things on poor Marie if Lloyd doesn't fight her. And that's how the brawl begins. Lloyd has everything under control because apparently, Makona's attacks are as useless as her brain. Lloyd then explains that being from Kunlun, her feeble attempts at harm mean absolutely nothing to him. Naturally, this just makes Makona even more furious. She thinks Lloyd is mocking her, so she goes all out, unleashing all her anger. Not only does she attack Lloyd, but she also targets the poor girls who happen to be there. Lloyd sacrifices himself, using his body as a shield to protect those girls. Of course, he ends up injured because apparently, self-preservation isn't his strong suit. Mikona mocks him for having friends, but Lloyd responds by saying that thanks to his friends, he can keep moving forward even though he's a complete novice. Lloyd activates his badass mode and takes on Mikona with all his might. The place starts collapsing and they end up falling into another cave. After all the nonsense, Lloyd manages to defeat Mikona by spinning her around like a ragdoll and sending her flying out of the dungeon. The girls check on Lloyd. 
but the snake they've been searching for decides to make an appearance, and it can talk. The snake named Vritra apparently recognizes Lloyd and comments on how big he's grown, but Lloyd has no freaking clue who this snake is. The last time Vritra saw Lloyd, he was just a little boy. Vritra takes this opportunity to introduce itself as the guardian beast of Kunlun. It goes on to explain that its main job is to protect the magical seals and maintain Alka's powers. And of course, Vritra can't help but complain about Alka's rude behavior. Apparently, he's been a victim of her constant bullying. Marie can totally relate. But Marie's mind starts wandering, as it always does. She wonders who the heck gave Makona the treat. Sue decides to make an appearance from the shadows. He provides an answer to Marie's burning question. And Sue decides to ask Lloyd what he looks like to him. But Lloyd, being the simpleton he is, replies that Sue looks like a bad man. But Sue doesn't stop there. For some reason, he decides to ask Lloyd if he plans to become a hero. Lloyd says yes because he wants to become a soldier. Elka decides to burst out from underground. Well, Sue, being the villain he is, fulfills his ultimate purpose for being there. He swiftly lands on top of Vritra, crushing his core like it's nobody's business. And just like that, Vritra is defeated. Sue takes this opportunity to explain that by defeating Vritra, the seal around Kunlun will be broken, and Alka will no longer have powers. Or at least, that's what Sue thought, because Alka still manages to deliver a powerful punch to his face. Turns out, Selen's belt is made from Vritra's skin. Because of this little detail, Vritra is still alive and Sue decides it's time to make his exit but not before he threatens them with releasing Kunlun and revealing the last dungeon. As the place begins to collapse, Alka helps them escape by teleporting them through her crystal. With things calmed down for now, Lloyd rests in his room and realizes that the hero in his book has the same name as the old man. Later that evening, Alka appears for the after party and informs Selen that she will accompany her to Kunlun, which surprises everyone. The rest of the group joins the journey because they are all curious about Kunlun, including Colleen and Chrome. Marie reminds them that the goal of this journey is to revive Ritra, or rather, return its original body, as the girls were already thinking of the selfish desires they can fulfill in Kunlun. Alan is not with them because he is obliged to participate in an exhibition duel between the kingdom of Azami, and Ju is the toughest guy in the kingdom. This is because he was given the title of Dragon Slayer by the king, who believed he was the one who defeated the giant snake and collapsed the dungeon. On the way, the group meets Yug, a dwarf who technically belongs to royalty. She helps them get to Kunlun through a portal. Upon arrival, they discover that the place is quite beautiful and peaceful. There's a fountain in normal houses, but the people's presence suggests they could destroy them with a single blow, as their superpowers are part of their everyday life, so it's not abnormal that everyone uses it often. The group is stunned after realizing that there is nothing normal in that village. Lloyd reunites with his grandfather, who turns out to be the inventor of the fighting style Philo uses. However, Philo is surprised and disappointed to learn that the fighting style she spent years learning is just an aerobic exercise routine that the villagers do every morning. Well, 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 look who finally arrives at Alka's house. Colleen wastes no time and asks Alka about the whereabouts of Mirthoffen. Alka tells them to check the wheat field. So off go Colleen and Chrome until they stumble upon Mirthoffen. And guess what he's wearing? A loincloth. Colleen is utterly disappointed to realize that the idiot she fell in love with is even dumber than she thought. Chrome decides to ask Mirthoffen when he plans on returning home. And Mirthoffen tells them he won't be coming back. Because, apparently, despite being controlled by some unknown force, he willingly participated in an attempted coup. And to make matters worse, he's fallen in love with life in the Kunlun village. He even enjoys farming, claiming it's his way of giving back. Lloyd has some villagers come to welcome him back from his grand journey. Selen assumes they're Lloyd's family and decides to introduce herself to them. And she hands them a piece of paper. It's a marriage registration form for her and Lloyd. Clearly, she's lost touch with reality. Their little moment is interrupted by a loud noise. According to Alka, it's a flying lizard. Riho offers to deal with the situation, but it turns out, it's not a lizard at all. It's a freaking dragon. Riho finds herself in a tight spot, but the village kids come to her rescue. They use Selen's marriage papers to craft paper planes, which they then hurl at the dragon. Miraculously, the dragon retreats. After this little escapade, the village decides to throw a welcome party to celebrate Lloyd becoming a soldier. Once the feast is over, the villagers bid their farewells and return home but not before they pry into Lloyd's personal life. Because, you know, everyone wants to know who his girlfriend is. Lloyd, being the clueless soul he is, claims he doesn't have one. 
that doesn't stop the villagers from making their recommendations. Some suggest Riho as a potential girlfriend, while others lean towards Philo. Amidst all the chatter and recommendations, poor Selen can't help but feel left out and frustrated. Feeling a mix of annoyance and desperation, she turns to Vritra for advice. It seems Vritra's wisdom and guidance weren't exactly what Selen had hoped for. The night sky is adorned with stars as the village settles down for a peaceful slumber. Within the cozy confines of their respective homes, our group of adventurers finds solace, each lost in their own thoughts and aspirations. Lloyd contemplates the path ahead. Will he truly become the hero he envisions, or is it all just a childish dream? Meanwhile, Colleen finds herself wrestling with the disappointment of Murthoffin's idiocy. She had hoped for more, but that dream has been shattered. Her heart aches with a mix of frustration and longing, unsure of where to turn next. Chrome, ever the inquisitive mind, ponders the mysteries of Kunlun village. And then there's Riho, still reeling from her encounter with the dragon. She knows that there's more to be found in this world, more opportunities to prove herself and claim her rightful place. As the night deepens and silence envelopes the village, our adventurers find themselves at a crossroads. And so, they rest, their minds filled with dreams and aspirations, eagerly awaiting the dawn of a new day and the continuation of their grand journey. Alka and Yu blabber on about some encounters with Su. Apparently, Su has this plan of releasing demon kings from the Kunlun dungeon for his own selfish gain. Of course, we don't get all the juicy details yet, but you just can't wait to move on to the next step. Alka, on the other hand, is playing the cautious card and doesn't want to repeat past mistakes. And to make matters worse, Yug mentions that Vritra is about to regain his memory. So Alka asks Yug for more time, as if she hasn't wasted enough already. Yug says that Alka has already waited too long. Meanwhile, we've got Murthoffin, the sorry excuse for a person, apologizing to Marie. Apparently, he got manipulated by some traveling merchant who gave him a mysterious egg and told him to show it to the king. And what does Mirth often do? He blindly obeys, and things start to go downhill from there. The worst part is that he can't remember what the merchant looked like. As if that wasn't enough, the group decides to go ahead with the resurrection of Ritra the next morning. Yug takes them to the last dungeon, which is supposed to be a prison but looks more like a fancy mansion according to Yug. And the key to entering the place is the Holy Sword. But they can't use it because Ritra is in some messed up form and Alka's powers are out of control. If they try to enter, they'll end up releasing all the demons, so they're safe for now. After all the drama with Vritra, Yug decides it's time to bring him back to his true form. By following a recipe for roast pork, apparently, I can already smell the burnt disappointment. They cook Vritra for three hours. They now have to wait for Vritra to hatch from some magical egg with his new form. While waiting for Vritra to hatch, Yug decides to give everyone a chance to unleash all their pent-up grievances against Alka. Marie is practically jumping with joy, but Alka gives her the death glare and shuts that down really quickly. Yug reminds the group about some exhibition duel happening the next day, so they all must go back and prepare for the match, and Yug will accompany them. Lloyd asks to go say goodbye to the villagers before they leave. The group agrees. How generous of them. Yug cunningly asks Alka for a private chat and she stupidly agrees. He throws her into a hole, declaring it his declaration of war. Talk about a trust issue. Turns out, Alka has the key to the last dungeon, and Yug wants it. Yug also spills all the beans. He tells Alka that he pretended to revive Vritra, but in reality, he sealed him in the egg. Alka is working with Su and Shoma too. They're all ready to unleash the demon lords and rebuild the world. As Yug leaves, he closes the hole, making sure no one can find Alka. Back with the group, Yug manages to convince them to return to the kingdom without Alka and Lloyd. All because he can't have Lloyd interfering with their plans, of course. Lloyd arrives late and Yug manipulates him, playing on Alka's supposed weakness. He plants the idea that she could be lost somewhere, and off Lloyd goes to search for her. Yug and the rest of the group have finally arrived back in the kingdom. But Colleen suddenly becomes sad because she didn't get a chance to say goodbye to Murthoffin. Lucky for her, Murthoffin had followed them, not because he cared, but because he wanted to give Marie some vegetables as souvenirs. He plans to return later. Yug starts freaking out for a moment. When asked why she's panicking, she lies through her teeth, claiming that she thought other villagers followed them. The truth is, she closed the portal, trapping Murthoffin and Lloyd with Alka, because she didn't want to be bothered, of course. So, based on these convenient lies, Yug manages to make the group believe that Alka and Lloyd are just fine and dandy. No need to worry, folks. Yug's got it all under control, or so she wants them to think. Later that evening, Riho is on her way to sell the clothes they borrowed from Kunlun when she gets approached by Yug. 
Yub offers to buy her mithril arm for a special price and even promises to repair the arm underneath. Riho isn't exactly thrilled with the offer, but she decides to keep Yub's offer in mind. She then meets Mina, who's running errands for Rawl. They decide to pay Rawl a visit, and Rawl is back to normal. Riho seizes the opportunity and asks Rawl if she remembers who was controlling her mind. Rawl doesn't remember, but she does recall that the guy asked her, what do I look like to you? Um, that phrase sounds familiar. Sue had asked Lloyd the same thing in the dungeon. Rawl remembers that the guy was accompanied by a smaller person, and all she can remember about that person is a clicking or snapping sound. Maybe they were sucking on candy or something. With all this information, Riho starts to have a bad feeling about Yuk, but she's not quite sure yet. And just as the event is about to commence, Chrome orders Riho to check the surrounding area, because the kings of Azami and Ju are visiting the stadium to see how the preparations are going. Meanwhile, poor Alan is hiding away because of the pressure put on him. Let's face it, he hasn't done anything to deserve all the random titles he's been bestowed with. As the king arrives, Riho notices Sue and Shoma standing beside him. Despite knowing all the terrible things Sue has done, she somehow manages to restrain herself from attacking him. But turns out that Sue is actually the king of Jiu. Riho decides to inform the king about the potential danger they could be in. At first, the king is skeptical, but when he learns that Riho is an acquaintance of Marie's through Chrome, he decides to lend an ear and listen to everything she has to say. Meanwhile, Alka is finally found by Lloyd. He confesses that he searched high and low for her, and in a stroke of childhood nostalgia, he remembers a hole where he once fell into. Suspiciously enough, he found a boulder placed at the entrance of said hole. Lloyd shares with Alka that it was in this very hole that he made up his mind to become stronger. Alka expresses her gratitude for his openness and realizes that she actually likes the world as it is now. She won't let anyone destroy it. Determined, they set off to rush back to the village. But there's a minor inconvenience. The portal has been closed, making their usual mode of transportation obsolete. But Alka devises a brilliant plan. She suggests using a cannon to launch Lloyd toward Azami. And to make things even speedier, Lloyd decides to amp up his velocity by using wind magic. The next day dawns, and it's time for the exhibition battle. Alan finds himself pitted against Mikona, who shows no mercy. The brutality of the fight alarms the king, who starts questioning Sue about what's going on. Sue reveals that the exhibition match wasn't just for show, but to demonstrate the good relationship between the two kingdoms. He wants to propose an alliance and dominate the world. And how does he plan to achieve this, you ask? by showcasing their technology that can turn humans into powerful weapons, using the powers of monsters. And to make it all possible, Azami will be providing the funds. Chrome and Mina try to step in and stop the madness, but Shoma uses his intimidating aura to scare them into submission. The king, finally realizing the gravity of the situation, rejects Sue's offer. Of course, Sue being the conniving little snake he is, moves on to plan B which involves none other than Yug. However, our group of girls intercepts Yug and manages to decipher her evil plans. They've uncovered her plot to unlock the last dungeon and trap Alka and Lloyd in Kunlun. The girls are determined to put a stop to her scheme, even though they may not be as strong as Yug or Lloyd. Yug summons a swarm of insect monsters to confront the girls but to Sue and Yug's surprise. The clever girls had anticipated something like this and replaced the audience with soldiers and adventurers. Talk about a twist. Now we have a full-blown brawl between humans and monsters. Meanwhile, Murthofen decides to make his grand entrance where the kings are and confronts Shoma. He heard about Shoma and Kunlun and how he left the village because he got tired of the rural life. Now, Murthofen is determined to make Shoma see the value of rural life and persuade him to return home. So what does he do? He faces off against Shoma using two god-tier artifacts shaped like agricultural tools. But Shoma decides to get all serious. He reveals that he didn't get bored of the countryside, he got bored of the world in general. He explains that he doesn't want Lloyd to experience the same as he did. Shoma wants to create a world where his dear brother can fulfill his dream of becoming a soldier. And apparently, a little conflict is necessary to achieve that world. So he decides to show off his power and easily defeats poor Murthofen with a single punch. Meanwhile, Riho and Marie are busy fighting off Makona, the creatures just keep multiplying. Then we have Philo, who swoops in and effortlessly takes down Mikona. Sue, on the other hand, incapacitates Mina and Chrome and demands that the king show him the way to the Holy Sword. But of course, here comes Alan rushing in to save the day. He cuts off Sue's arm, only to be stunned when it starts regenerating. Can't even chop off an arm properly. Alan then unveils his big secret. Apparently, he's some ancient rune magic experiment, created to be a hero. He was supposed to disappear after the world was saved 
But that never happened. Over time, his presence began to fade, and now, he's only an unstable presence seen differently by each person. Now Alan's plan is to disappear. But first, he needs to defeat Alka to become evil and turn Lloyd into the new hero. And just when you think things couldn't get any crazier, Lloyd makes his entrance, completely clueless about what's happening. Turns out that Alka left out some crucial details and fed him a twisted version of the story. Yub tries to set the record straight and spills the beans about her true intentions of releasing demon lords into the world. But Lloyd thinks it's all a load of rubbish. He's got one job, and that's breaking the egg that holds Vritra. Lloyd thinks he can just snatch that egg away from you by throwing a measly rock at her. Yug clings to that egg for dear life and has a clever plan up her sleeve to keep Lloyd at bay. Yug summons a stone golem and merges it with Mikona, giving the golem some power up. Marie pleads with Lloyd to save Mikona, and he agrees to lend a hand. Lloyd manages to send the golem flying with his feeble attempts, but the thing changes its course in midair and comes right back at him. But Lloyd counters the golem's attack and breaks its arm. But of course, the arm just grows back like it's nothing. He tries dismantling the golem again, but all its parts regenerate. It's like playing a never-ending game of whack-a-mole. Marie suggests that Makona is the golem's regenerative core, and the only way to help Lloyd is to separate her from the golem. Easier said than done, because those pesky insects won't let them get close. Meanwhile, Lloyd, in his futile attempt to avoid hitting Makona, misses a shot, leaving himself wide open for the golem's wrath. It starts pounding on him like a ragdoll, and Lloyd thinks he's too weak to save his friend and win the fight. But just as he's about to throw in the towel, Murthoffin comes to the rescue. He questions whether Lloyd will let his precious dream crumble so easily. With those words, Lloyd musters up the courage to stand up and fight alongside Murthoffin. Then Riho in the midst of the battle, realizes that Makona responds to Marie's voice. She offers her precious underwear to free Makona from the golem's control. I guess underwear has magical powers now. And it actually works. Makona manages to break free. Yug can't even keep her focus, and at that moment, Selen swoops in and snatches the egg right out of her pocket. But then Selen demands that Vritra show itself. And when nothing happens, she resorts to the most diabolical threat of all, recounting the entire story of Lloyd's adventures. Selen's threat actually works. Vritra breaks free from its seal. Back to Lloyd, who finally manages to get his act together and disintegrates the weakened golem using some wind magic. But Yug, realizing she's no match for our hero, decides to call for backup. However, her so-called colleagues are too busy filming a stupid video of Lloyd fighting off those pesky insects. To add insult to injury, Yug's colleagues refuse to lend a hand because their grand plan is to make Lloyd the hero. Too bad for Yug, because just at that moment, Alka decides to make her grand entrance. She effortlessly deals with the remaining insects by showering them with boulders. But before Alka can capture Yug, Shoma swoops in and saves Yug. And of course, Su tags along. They retreat with the promise of returning another time. And just like that, everything returns to normal. Murthoffin finally goes back to Izami. Back at Marie's house, the girls continue their usual playful arguments over Lloyd. Until it's time to enjoy a meal prepared by Lloyd himself. Watch this next video. See you on the next one.